capitalism, all of the gains in automation, it goes to the owner class. All you have to do is have everyone be an owner, and now suddenly, any gain in automation is a gain for everybody. If you grow just one thing, it may not grow as well as if it grows with another thing. A good example of that is called the, the Three Sisters Method of Farming. There is definitely multi-apartment buildings or multi-families that do do a passive A hundred million dollars that they gave to Joe Rogan that they would kind of be out if they breach contract. Is that a bigger number? Or is two billion a bigger number? <laughs> It's a tough one. I know. Really hard. And maybe, maybe yes. comparing numbers is not uh, Jeremy Strong. Gotta go kill a Jenny. I still don't think you should kill her. I don't think it's a good idea. It's a ghost, dude. Welcome back, everybody, to Bread Theory. Tonight we're going to be continuing on uh, after a long hiatus doing this series, um, covering Howard Zinn's *The People's History of the United States*, and we are on the chapter that covers. Uh, slavery in the united states as well as the civil war we're in the the part that's leading up to uh the civil war and looking at what lincoln is doing at the time um let's see i'll just say as, as always this is a place of learning so don't feel bad about asking questions even if you feel silly asking them only silly question is the one asked in bad faith. So, I always like to help people learn. I try not to be condescending or, or you know, <laughs> there's plenty of things that I don't know myself. It's not as though I know, you know, anything or everything on, on any particular subject. So, we're all on a journey. It's part of why we do this. Um, so, yeah. Let's see, anything, nothing really coming up anymore. No events really to announce. Um, upcoming Sunday, we'll be doing the series with Dan Platt again on organizing uh, movements towards a, a utopia um, and looking at ideas of utopia as well. Um, yeah, I think that's that's about it. So we'll get into the chapter. And as always, trigger warning. This is a, this is this especially is a is a rough one. Uh, the audiobook file that I have selected does edit out racial epithets, but it is dealing with probably the worst thing that the U.S. ever did. Certainly, the worst institution it ever upheld. Uh, so yeah, just be warned. It's not, it's not going to be a, a pleasant subject. So here we are, uh, looking at, at Kennedy, or not Kennedy, looking at Lincoln, who is trying to keep certain slaveholding states in the Union, including Maryland and Delaware. Don't think of them as, as slaveholding states, but at one time they certainly were. All right, so we will get into the, the book now. Here we go. It was only as the war grew more bitter, the casualties mounted, desperation to win heightened, and the criticism of the abolitionists threatened to unravel the tattered coalition behind Lincoln that he began to act against slavery. Hofstadter puts it this way, quote, Like a delicate barometer, he recorded the trend of pressures, and as the radical pressure increased, he moved toward the left, unquote. Wendell Phillips said that if Lincoln was able to grow, quote, it is because we have watered him, unquote. So there you have it. Uh, people think of, of Lincoln as, as being one of the most moral presidents ever to, you know, take this courageous stand against a really heinous institution, uh, an objectively bad thing to do to other human beings, and, uh, wasn't entirely the case. He, he definitely had to be pushed to it. He had to feel that there was the political will behind it in order to take that stand against slavery. And, you know, slavery economically was, was a very powerful force. You will sometimes hear conservatives say that um, it was due to economic pressures that, that slavery went away. And that's not, 
that's not entirely true. For the people that owned slaves, especially a lot of slaves, it was incredibly, almost unfathomably profitable. Uh, that's the entire reason they did it. Um, and to say that just having cheap labor somehow would ever usurp it economically, eh, not the entire story. Um, because it's still incredibly cheap to keep people, give them nothing, and, and have all of their surp, you know, not even have a surplus value, but all of the value that they create goes straight to you. You give them a few huts uh, to live in, which is, you know, hardly having to pay for um, even uh, tenement housing at the time. Like, if you hire a worker, they have to at least be able to afford a room in, in a tenement house. Not so with the slave. So the idea that slavery was ever inevitably going to be crushed by capitalism, not really true. There, there definitely were uh, technological factors that were putting pressure on the institution of slavery. But that too is largely because if you just have a bunch of labor, free labor that you can throw at, at any situation, in any economic endeavor, there's not really a whole lot of incentive to innovate. Because um, it's, it's all profit. Everything that comes in is profit to you. Uh, minus the meager scraps that that you give to just barely keep your slaves alive. In many cases, not even keep your slaves alive. So, so yeah. Um, I mean, slavery still exists today. <laughs> and it is because it is a profitable thing to do. Um, yeah, why, why, why else would people go to the, I mean, you, you know, you look at people that do, do like human trafficking of one kind or another. Why would they go to the, the trouble of um, being definitely against the, doing things that are definitely illegal that they could get into actually a lot of trouble for that, you know, one of those crimes that people routinely get arrested for and long prison sentences for. Why would they go to the trouble of, of doing all that if it would be cheaper just to hire those same people on at minimum wage. Doesn't make a lot of sense if you take two seconds to, to think about it. But then again, you know, slavery apologia never, <laughs> never has a whole lot backing it in the first place. Uh, so anyway, the point, yeah, that we've now strayed from a little bit was that, that Lincoln, not, you know, more of a cool calculating sort of guy than than a courageous uh, political leader so and that's not to take away from the fact that he did launch a war and, and successfully wage a war against the institution of slavery and that that institution did end with the end of the Civil War those are monumentous uh, feats to to be done oh god and we'll get I get I get we'll, I've only done a few seconds now, so I feel like I don't want to dwell too much on, on this part before we get back into the book, but conservatives always like to bring up that the Republicans were the ones that ended slavery. And it's just such a ridiculous argument, because like, if that is your the height of your party, that, that's your claim to fame, was, was ending slavery, and you don't have anything else to point at from that point on, now 150 years on, mm -hmm kind of doesn't say a whole lot about how uh, progressive or human rights oriented the Republican Party is. And it's just, it's a ridiculous, another set of, of apologia, just trying to make Republicans look better, <laughs> gain some cheap political points and, and fool people that, that haven't thought too much about politics. Um, so, but yeah, let, let's continue on in the book. Racism in the North was as entrenched as slavery in the South, and it would take war to shoot both. New York blacks could not vote unless they owned $250 in property, a qualification not applied to whites. A proposal to abolish... How about that? Now, why would they not want them to be enfranchised, you know? <laughs> 
It's it's like we always just fight the same fights forever, it seems. All the, the voter laws that Republicans are trying to push now to protect the integrity of elections and then so forth. Or under that guise anyway. Uh when the result is always less people vote. <laughs> and that's what they like. Because they, they don't really have a majority hardly anywhere anymore. There, there are definitely some stronghold districts across the country. Um, but statewide, uh, you know, you look at a, look at a state like uh, just next door to me, Wisconsin, where the only way that they win the majority they do in, I believe it's in the, the, the state house, um, is to, to gerrymander the hell out of every district. It's called, uh, one of the techniques, it's called packing and cracking. So you, you, you draw the, the voting lines to push um, as many uh, liberals into one area as possible when you know that you can't beat them in a certain area. So you get as many of them as possible into one area so that, you know, they have one district here, one district there. And then the other districts you crack apart. So you take a piece of them here, a piece of them there, where otherwise they, they would, you know, numerically they, they have a majority because Democrats do numerically have a majority in Wisconsin. But because they've been, you, you take a piece and you put it in a very red district, you take another piece and you put another very red district, that's called cracking. You gerrymander it in a way so that structurally you get over half the representation of the, the state. And that's what the Republicans are down to. So they, they will try any sort of dirty trick to keep people from voting in all the name of, of integrity from some phantom problem that, that never actually materializes. In fact, the people that, that end up getting caught, by and large, uh, voting more than once, doing underhanded and sneaky voting um, tactics, they tend to be Repu Republican. And, and the, the reason given is usually they're, they're convinced that the other side is doing the same thing. I ah, wonder how they got that notion. Probably from their, their own party. Anyway, let's continue on. I'll publish this, but on the ballot in 1860, was defeated two to one. Although Lincoln carried New York by 50,000 votes. Frederick Douglass commented, quote, The black baby of Negro suffrage was thought too ugly to exhibit on so grand an occasion. The Negro was stowed away, like some people put out of sight their deformed children when company comes, unquote. Again, it's like the same fights forever. Because that same sort of thing took place in, in Georgia. Um, I think it was the last presidential election, in fact, when the Democrats, for the first time since probably Jimmy Carter, won the state of Georgia. And that was not... For for not for lack of trying on the Republicans' part, they uh, probably illegally purged the the voter rolls of many as many counties as they could, of as many Democrats as they could, which tend to be still black people. Um, but they couldn't do it quite enough, and lo and behold, Georgia was carried by the Democrats, and they won to. Uh, it was both senators, right? So it's just funny how this this stuff just keeps coming around again and again. And you think about how Marx said stuff like uh, geography is destiny, and you you look at some of these maps and some of the voter uh, patterns, and you will see that it's very pronounced in places like Alabama where the, the highest concentration of, of slaves uh, at the time now still has the highest concentration of black people living in those same areas and the highest concentration of uh, very democratic voters. And it all lines up with the most fertile soil in the state, this band of, of incredibly fertile soil that was good for growing cotton. So all this stuff happened because of geography. It's, uh, it, yeah. It's a very, 
it's a difficult statement to wrestle with. Um, I've been watching this other series, which I plan to cover on the stream sometime. It's called uh, What is Politics? That's the channel. I'll go ahead and recommend it now. I'll put it out in the chat so y'all can look at it yourself. But uh, he was talking about how he was talking about David Graeber and his analysis of history and, and anthropology and how a lot of times he was trying to argue that geography was not in fact destiny, that material conditions did were not the deciding factor in the way that a culture came down. And this, this guy, this video creator of what is politics, uh, was trying to argue that no, it's still the, the by and large, the largest factor. And he had some pretty good arguments for it. So yeah, check out this channel here. Um, I'll share both the channel and the playlist specifically. But I'm really getting to like this, this channel quite a bit. We will cover their series. Uh, what is the playlist called? Theories, lectures, old to new. That's the one. So it's really, it's on political literacy. And it goes from the very basic, you know, what do all these definitions that people throw around all the time actually mean? When Charlie Kirk says he's against socialism, what what is he exactly talking about? You know, surprise, surprise, it's not any real or useful definition of socialism. It's just the government doing things, basically. Well, hello. Hi, guys. So we're going to be having, joining us, uh, the, the lovely Amanda. What up? Bam. Hey, do you have a full charge? No, I just put it in. I got about half a charge, though. You can have it. Okay. Everybody. Yeah. So, let's get you your cans, as we call them in the business. Put on the cans. Oh, now I got two sets of cans. Um, see, I knew you were. I knew you were gonna go there. You open the box. Yeah. Well, I, I, I play a good straight man in our little comedy duo. I gotta untangle my cord here. Uh, so you're not going to be singing crop copyrighted music on my stream the whole time, are you? No. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, welcome, Amanda. Uh, let's see if we got the video. Oh, here, right? one more viewer just showed up. Hey, see, you you are the, the magic. Um, <laughs> let's, let's readjust the camera so you're a little bit more in no, frame. No, it's okay. You sure? Yeah, I like to be... Oh, you like to be lurking on the side? Yeah. Cool. They see me lurking. Oh my god. We, we're just in a very singy mood, aren't we? You're not going to be so singy when we when we delve into our topic here, though. We're, I know. We're in the thick of the American Civil War. Gross. I know. It's pretty bad. We were just learning about how Lincoln did not exactly take a strong stance against um, slavery at the beginning. Uh... He basically had to be pushed by abolitionists and people just making a lot of noise and, and political agitation. Yeah. And then he finally took up the cause. He also suffered for some pretty severe depression. Did he? Mm -hmm. I was not aware of that part. It's very interesting. Uh, let's see. So where are we at? We are here. We are here. We are present. And it is now. We're breathing in. We're breathing in, yeah. We're breathing out. That's great. We're taking in. And we're exhaling the negativity. Hmm. We a lot of negative to exhale. Now they're talking about how voting wasn't the time for black people and how they had to pay a poll tax. Um, oh boy, I can't wait till not... we bring that back. 
I was just talking about that, how it seems like we just fight these same fights forever. Like, Republicans are at the point where they can only win structurally in a lot of places. But to be honest, I kind of feel like the Republicans kind of broke to themselves. Oh, they like always they do. Starting yeah, like to they just, split apart. Into... They don't have popular ideas. No one likes their ideas, and they don't really have any ideas of how to make the country better. Because we don't value antiquity. Yeah, right. We value progress. <laughs> I don't know what that's a quote from, but... Me? You? Well, that's, that's a pretty good one. You could start a whole series on that. Like a David Attenborough-style documentary. But... Yeah, and I could start with a chair facing the wall, and then I could spin around spin real around. slow. Really. <laughs> and then over spin and have to correct again. Yeah. I don't care much for smoking. I could pretend to smoke a cigar. Probably vape. Ew. Gotta modernize it for the kids, right? I've seen that what that does to your teeth. I'm not touching that ever. Fine. You can you can eat a gummy then. <laughs> on camera. <laughs> In case I'll just be spinning the whole time. Oh boy. Yeah, well, that's only if you do three. I didn't do three, did I? I thought you did three. Was it only two? It was only two. Okay. So one and a half is your limit. And that's my limit, too, usually. Any more than that, and I start, like, time skipping. And... The first time I took two, I had some cheese, and that was not a good idea. So now I don't eat when I Yeah, she was, con <laughs> she was convinced that uh, she was going to choke on the cheese that she was eating. And the microwave told me She's it like, would. I for I forgot how to eat, guys. <laughs> I felt like I was chewing uh, for a really long time, and then the digital and it just it just wouldn't get any smaller or softer in your mouth. <laughs> and yeah, the, the 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 stove clock was sending you messages. Both times, so we just yeah, have to stay times, away from right? digital appliances. Well, hello, Alexis uh, Clement. How are you doing tonight? Hi. Um, all right. Well, let's get rid. Uh, let's get back into the book here. Are you ready to learn about some more? I'm ready to learn. Some more bullshit that the U.S. did. I took my busy break and I'm sitting in the chair and I have a drink of water. And I'm, I'm ready. Okay. I just don't have a fidget. Don't. Oh, you know what? You can turn on my owl. Let's press the on button. You gotta be pointing. It it doesn't like the remote very much. You gotta point like right at it. There you go. You can mess around with it too. That's my fidget. Ah, oh, that can be your fidget. Here we go. Wendell Phillips, with all his criticism of Lincoln, recognized the possibilities in his election. Speaking at the Tremont Temple in Boston the day after the election, Phillips said, "Quote: If the telegraph speaks the truth for the first time in our." history, the slave has chosen a president of the United States. Not an abolitionist, hardly an anti-slavery man. Mr. Lincoln consents to represent anti-slavery ideas. Upon on the political chessboard, his value is in his position. With fair effort, we may soon change him for knight, bishop, or queen, and sweep the board. Applause. I don't okay. understand chess. What, what don't you understand about it? The Ever. strategy, or...? Yeah, I mean, like, but I know... Do you know how to play chess? No. Oh, you never know... I can play checkers. Play? Okay. It's like that, but for Harder. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's not that complicated. Each, each piece has a different sort of move that it can do. There's a way that it can move and a way that it can kill other pieces. And uh, you're trying to get the other person's king in checkmate, where they have no other option... But to die. Of course, all the pawns go first. They they rush out there into the battlefield and get slaughtered. But you gotta watch by the dozens. You gotta you gotta. There's not a dozen. It's just, it's just like eight. Right. So you know how many pawns there are, but you don't know how to play chess. I can describe it. I can like physically describe the pieces in the board. Okay. See. So yeah. I know a little. Okay. We should play chess sometime. Okay. I am not good at chess. Neither so. am I. George George played with me and I made two moves and he almost flipped the table on me, so... Oh, did you not move it in the way that it was supposed to be moved? I, I made my queen vulnerable and I died right away. Oh, okay. And he was mad about that? Yeah, he's like, you're so stupid. It's like... <laughs> That's nice, George. Way, way to really uh, 
<laughs> be a teacher in that moment. Yeah. That's okay. We'll work on it. Anyway. Anyway. We will continue on. Conservatives in the Boston upper classes wanted reconciliation with the South. At one point, they stormed an abolitionist meeting at that same tree temple shortly after Lincoln's election and asked that concessions be made to the South, quote, in the interests of commerce, manufacturers, agriculture, unquote. Huh. So the conservatives of the day said we would love to abolish slavery. It, it would be the most wonderful thing if we could accomplish it. Accomplish it. But uh, someone's got to think of the economy. Someone's got to think of commerce. That doesn't remind you of any modern day conservatives, surely. All of them. Like, we would love to, well, like, to solve well, let's, climate let's change. Let's also say the Dems are like that too. It's just more. Well, I mean, at least they. Sneaky. They, they at least talk as though they're going to change something. Well, you know what? I think I've hit the threshold, and this is probably why I've become a leftist. Yeah. Like, talking ain't shit. I need to see action. Right. I'm tired of hearing about your sunshine and farts ideas. Yeah. I need to see execution. I need to see action. I need to see... You, you mean just kneeling in, in kente cloth uh, for the amount of time that, that George Floyd had his neck kneeled on is not the same as police reform? It sure isn't. Wow. Like, You're blowing my mind. If both happened... Because, like... Okay, not everyone can partake because of abilities or interests or whatever in the movement the same way. But politicians sure as hell can. Yeah. <laughs> they actually can do stuff. Because they're just a bunch of dragons. Like, I mean, they are all constrained by capitalism and, and the enshrinement in the Constitution of private property. Okay, let's just say this. I don't think they're constrained. No, they, no, they definitely are. It's not as though they could just, like... They probably could not vote to abolish private property to, tomorrow and have it stick without doing a constitutional convention, <laughs> totally redoing everything. I... You get what I'm saying, though. And then also, because moneyed interests have such an outsized influence through well basically legal bribery at this point through campaign contributions all sorts of super PACs and what what so we are slate oh can i is that a bad word we're what s-l-a-v-e i mean you can say a slave sure i was trying to be mindful sure we are to submit to our employers right give everything for the employer the employer is held hostage by capital the money to a certain extent yes to a certain to extent much less so, extent than employees but and yes. so are politicians but the uh -huh. dollar's falling and it's basically worthless so well, it's not worthless like maybe if these these countries go on to uh the yuan standard and get off the the u.s dollar standard in even in, in valuating oil, then, then maybe it'll be worth less. But to say that it's just going to fall off entirely, I, I don't know. Because I'm, not it's, saying, it's... I'm not saying complete. I'm just, I'm making a statement more or less about how we are all held hostage to something. Right. Uh, the system, you know, is, is puppeteer to all of us. That, that, that is true to a certain extent. We, we cannot just... Because, like, these politicians aren't going to stop doing what they're doing because yeah. their best interests are sure. served by... I, I couldn't just decide to stop following the rules of, of private property ownership and stuff like that and, like, say, this is, this is going to be my property now that I need to use for my own... I couldn't just go seize the means of production by walking up to my boss and saying, this is mine now, and I don't, I don't subscribe to your bourgeois sensibilities i don't subscribe to your channel yeah. sir I, I unsubscribe to you sir that's gonna be like <laughs> the gentleman's tell off of the future i unsubscribe i like the condolence card well, i'm sorry for your loss of me this is my two weeks notice <laughs> best wishes that's funny no but I'm, I'm not even saying quitting i'm just saying like i unsubscribe from laws that say that you own this property and this business and i'm going to take over now i couldn't just do that and like 
<laughs> you could. It's just not going to go okay. where you want it to. Uh, for, for like, uh, you know, the few minutes it takes it to the police to show up and actually enforce the owner's property rights. So, yeah. Which is funny. Like, again, it's enforcing the property owner's. Like, oh, la di da, I own stuff. <laughs> we should say that to, to business owners. Oh, la di da, I own things. It's like, I have a personality. It's probably way better than yours, but I ain't getting any money for that. <laughs> I mean, if you're doing stand up, then maybe you would be. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready for that, though? This is going to be a 10 minute set of you impersonating the lady who impersonates the Kardashians. Oh my oh, god. Oh, oh. Not private property. Oh. <laughs> diabetes. Diabetes, not diabetes. Okay, we should probably Which move is on. another system that has us submitting to it the medical industry, and you're having yes. to fight with your own insurance that was provided to you as a benefit. Right. That's because okay. everything that people need, the most profitable businesses, tend to be the ones that either people really want, like a vice, like a gambling, or I mean, if it were in places where it's legal sex work or you know drugs, that sort of thing, or it is it is commodifying something that people absolutely need to live, like housing, healthcare, transportation, um, food, all that sort of thing. Yeah, everybody should have a right to it if it's yeah. available. Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm increasingly convinced that the way to really build a, a, a true counter movement to capitalism has to start with liberating people. You know, I, I would almost call it like a uh, liberatory anarchism where you build up institutions still that you know they still have to operate within capitalism to a certain extent but you can at least make them say like a cooperative a worker own cooperative and then take some of the the um revenue from that to start building free housing and start building free tra transportation free education you know open a school um so on and so forth because the people that that especially after listening to this this series this uh what is politics series it seems that that a lot of the mistakes of, of past revolutionaries or, or some of the shortcomings i should even say are that they they tend to be from the intellectual class so people that that actually have time to sit around and, and think and organize and plan and, and aren't just scraping by and and you know elbowing their neighbors just to survive um but this is why we have to oh sorry this i mean the, the, but the, the, that's what i'm saying like like if those are the sorts of people that can actually lead revolutions um and the the difficulty with that is they tend to end up wanting to continue leading things afterwards after the the old power has been overthrown um and then they just entrench a new set of power which you know for better or worse usually is better than the the old one but you know, I digress a little bit. Anyway, the, if that's the case, that these are the ones who, who are actually able to do a, a real revolution, then we have to liberate as many people to be in that same position as possible. Which also means not looking down on, on you know, working class people. Um, that's just like the whole thing of it. Or rural people or any of this sort of thing. Like everyone has skills everyone has something they're good at absolutely it does not matter some everyone is bringing something to the yeah. table and, that's the whole and point it's of not leftism, our yeah. job to like decide what the value of that is or if that person's worth it like we're all worth it mm -hmm. because we all like yeah we all deserve to have good lives that's that's the whole ebb and flow though that's i mean that's at the core of, of being a leftist that everyone deserves to have a good life no one deserves to be exploited and trampled over it just so that other people can have things a little bit better right no like, one should be someone else's stepping stone like for example we work with 
uh, adults on the spectrum and it's a transition program and it's helping them get uh, <laughs> sorry for uh, automating that comment that that's one of the comments <laughs> that contained a word that i automod but thank you that, that that's a good way of putting it alexis your existence is simply enough um it is sorry where was i going oh yes so we work with adults on the spectrum mm -hmm. in a transition program and like we have different tiers of like function i don't know if they figure it's functionality it's more like needs like, needs. like how many need how much needs do they have but day. we've been trying to work on bringing some of the higher needs folks out into the community who have the best time oh yeah and are so excited to be out and so excited to help and even though their efforts are two hours worth of plating up food to feed to the homeless or washing dishes to help serve the community they're still so excited by it like this it breaks my heart because they don't get valued like <clears throat> society sees them as like oh yeah what good can you do well i mean you know even not your job even some of the people we work with are, are afraid of them um without any grounds to be but beyond that uh yeah everyone has worth everyone has value and everyone deserves to have as good a life as possible that's, yep. that's that's the core of leftism if you don't agree with that if you think there are natural hierarchies and then some people are just destined to rule and some people are just the betters uh and, and deserve to be the elites of society then yeah there's there's not many leftist arguments that are going to reach you but some folks prefer to be in certain positions they prefer certain <clears> roles <throat> and I really do think at the end of the day, though, not everyone is going for the same thing. Not everybody wants to be a doctor. Sure. Not everybody sure. can be a doctor. Sure. Be it like, you know, blood makes them nauseous or other bodily functions are yeah. too much to handle. But you need as many people as you can that are willing to put in the time and effort and whatever. Like. Well, I mean. That, that doctor needs to have a clean space in order to effectively do their job. That doctor needs to have a place to go get their meals when they're not serving patients. That doctor needs a lot of tools to be manufactured and equipment to be manufactured for them to be an effective doctor. So everyone has a part to play. Right. And it, the whole thing could unravel if one person was not playing their part or one role was not being filled. Mm -hmm. So, they're, they're, I mean, there definitely are as David Graeber puts it, bullshit jobs out there, jobs that don't need to exist, that only exists on paper to make someone look good um, or uh, because no one really knows what they do and they just haven't been <clears throat> eliminated yet as, as redundant. But those people too deserve to have a better life and, and not be stuck at a job that they know produces nothing. Like, like you will see time and time again that that humans want more than anything to be useful to the world useful mm -hmm. to other people um and so that you know if we take away the need to have to survive then people are going to choose to be useful and choose to do useful things by and large All right like that person serving the community was so overjoyed wanted to stay longer mm -hmm. we couldn't because we had other stuff to do yeah. but like if this is something that's fulfilling to that person and they're helping like take your ball and go home mm -hmm. like leave him alone he isn't they're not hurting anyone they're they're helping they're helping and yeah. that's how they can contribute yeah, yeah he was so proud i saw the pictures of him uh packing lunches for for homeless people he was so proud that he got to help feed people um you know N not for nothing, but because also he is often food insecure himself. So he knows exactly what it's like to, to go hungry. He's he was He was so happy and felt so proud of himself to be helping other people not be hungry. 
Right. And that really cool. is just as value. The dishwasher is just as much value as the chef. Oh, yeah. Everybody has a role to play. The kitchen Everyone will shut down without dishwashers. You know, dishes will pile up in, in, you know, the first lunch rush. Yep. And you'd be done for the day. Like, that would be it if no one was doing it. Right. And then how are you going to function the next day when you still have a mountain of dirty dishes and no one to wash them? Mm -hmm. Or that's willing to wash them? Mm -hmm. And to think about things, too, like people get a lot of burnout at their jobs. So it's like, what if somebody does become like a therapist or a physician and they need like a six month break? Because they're just like, oh my, I can't, mm -hmm. right? Give them the option. Hey, you want to do something that requires less skill, less taxing on your mind for a while? Or maybe you had surgery and you need something that's a lower impact. Mm -hmm. Hey, you can do this for a little bit. Yeah, without having to risk losing everything and, and right. you know, be financially insolvent, potentially. Yeah, because like... I mean, I can't hang out in the house all day. It's not good oh, for me at most all. Most people can't. Like, the people that can hang out in the house all day most often have depression. And that depression is most often caused under capitalism by feeling worthless. Feeling like you can't amount to anything. Um, feeling that you are not doing a productive job. Uh, so, take away those pressures and you'll have a lot less depressed people and a lot more people that are willing and able to help out society and people that can take a break when they need to yeah. i think that's yeah that's so important. important for sure um yeah i very much am enjoying this this side tangent of a conversation but i think we should probably get back in and, and make some more progress in the book okay but thanks for your input that was really good the spirit of Congress, even after the war began, was shown in a resolution it passed in the summer of 1861 with only a few dissenting votes. Quote, This war is not waged for any purpose of overthrowing or interfering with the rights of established institutions of those states, but to preserve the Union. Unquote. The abolitionists stepped up their campaign. Emancipation petitions poured into Congress in 1861 and 1862. In May of that year, here, Wendell Phillips said, quote, Abraham Lincoln may not wish it, he cannot prevent it. The nation may not will it, but the nation cannot pre prevent it. I do not care what men want or wish. The Negro is the pebble in the cogwheel, and the machine cannot go until you get him out. In July, Congress passed a Confiscation Act, which enabled the free gross. Until you get him out. Well, I, thought they, I thought he had said it was an abolitionist who was saying that, so maybe I just don't understand... The metaphor but i i think do you want me to put it in modern terms for you okay how do you how do you see how do you interpret it it's me yeah. hi i'm the problem <laughs> well no but i i think what he was trying to say was that we cannot continue as a nation while we allow this 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 problem of slavery to continue like i, I you know we are we are destined to fail if we allow this to happen so you have to make this also about slavery we cannot just hold back and say this is oh no, no 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 it's just to preserve preserve the institution and, and hold everything together you have to take on the the big problem mm -hmm. all right let's move on no slaves of those fighting in the union but this was not enforced by the union generals and lincoln ignored the non-enforced Enforcement. Garrison called Lincoln's policy, quote, stumbling, halting, prevaricating, irresolute, weak, besotted. And Phillips said Lincoln was, quote, a first-rate, second-rate man, unquote. <laughs> An exchange of letters between Lincoln and Horace Greeley, editor of the New York Tribune, in August of 1862, gave Lincoln a chance to express his views. Greeley wrote, quote, Dear sir, I do not enjoy to tell you, for you must know already, the great proportion of those who triumphed in your election are sorely disappointed and deeply pained by the policy you seem to be pursuing with regard to the slaves of rebels. We require of you, as the first servant of the Republic, charged especially and preeminently with this duty, that you execute the laws. We think you are strangely and disastrously remiss with regard to the emancipating provisions of the new 
Confiscation Act. We think you are unduly influenced by the counsels of certain politicians hailing from the border slave states. Greeley. So, what what this makes me reminded of is is all those people who you know they're ironically calling themselves anarcho Bidenists and and you know. Oh, you, you never, you're definitely not as online as I am. So you luckily missed all that. Is there like some meditation bell that's going off very softly in the background? Yeah, does that bother you? I just, it keeps throwing me. Okay, well, we'll move on to the next track. I feel like Pavlov. Sorry. There's no treats, though. Do you want a different type of music entirely? Can we just not? Because our conversation in the audiobook is, is overstimulating. All right. I can go if you need that. No, exercise. I didn't say that. Uh, anyway, so there was, there was this time during the, the last uh, election when all these people were like, oh, I'm an anarcho-Bidenist. I'm only strategically supporting Biden. But then, then once he gets into office, we'll, we'll hold his feet to the fire. We'll hold his feet to the fire. We'll push him and push him and push him left, all this stuff. And... But I don't that know. Didn't happen. Aside from the people that that have always been criticizing him, there's not really a big movement of people that from the left that that are constantly criticizing him and his policies and pushing him to, you know, follow through a little bit harder with debt relief and 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 student loan cancellation. Follow through a little bit harder with um, getting more money from COVID relief. Uh, follow through on any of his other promises. And I just don't see that big movement of people pushing him left. It seems that most of those people just kind of went back to sleep after um, after the election, as I was pessimistically thinking that they probably would. Well, they have track records, so... Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like as as soon as as the election was decided, um, like I, I don't know if you call it bread tube or left tube, but the 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 content creators, the leftist content creators on on YouTube and other platforms, uh, there was not as many new ones coming out, and the ones that were out were not pushing as hard. It just it seems like. There's not a lot of momentum left, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, unfortunately. But, like, we can't give up now. Oh, absolutely not. Um, like the It really way... is important to, to push him. And, but, like, the, the example of these abolitionists here, they had something that they really believed in. And, like, I don't know, there's there's no great material reason that... that any white person would have been an abolitionist at that time, and yet they still were because they really believed in it. Um, and they stuck to their principles. And, and hearing hearing the these speeches from these these abolitionists is, is, I mean, it makes you a little bit envious of the political leaders of our time or of of their time versus our time. Like, where, where do we have that? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Makes me a little sad. I was like disappointed in the Democrats and they could have put up someone so much more bold, so much more progressive, and yeah, they right. took like the most yeah. milk toast person. Basically, a cardboard cutout won the the not won the election against Trump, which kind of showed that anyone could have. And I mean, it's not all their fault. It, it it was definitely Bernie's strategy to, to kind of ignore states like South Carolina, which ended up being critically important. And um, he he could have done a better job of of reaching out to a broader coalition. But still, the Democrats are going to throw him under the table. Well, yeah, it, um, it, 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 they definitely deserve most of the blame. Is the the DNC itself because they're never. You know they're going to do everything in their power to resist anyone that upsets the gravy train, and that's almost always going to be the the progressive wing. Which is sad because it's they, what we need to see. Like, yeah, we have so many issues right now. Like, 
I think we're on the brink of some pretty dangerous times if we don't get our shit together. I mean, we're already in dangerous times. Like, the idea that they're, they, they, you know, reversed Roe versus Wade and, and immediately forced, rammed through all these horrible abortion uh, prevention bills and that they're, you know, pushing anti-trans legislation. Like, these these are real things. These are not just, like, culture war bullshit. Right. Know, people getting outraged about which M&M is sexiest or if they're not as sexy as they used to be. Um, uh, maybe somebody needs to worry about some other stuff. <laughs> yeah, like, that stuff. That stuff doesn't matter. But, like, there's legislation that is going through under a, a you know, a supposedly Democrat led country is is uh pretty worrying and and pretty disgusting and he doesn't seem too bothered by either which... that's that's also the thing it's like he's not even showing leadership against it you know he might make a really it's like really lame statement oh snap they got us and mm. oh my god i can't because i could go down this for hours like i hate yeah. it it's like they they app up mm -hmm. big time and then it's oh send us five dollars and we'll do everything we can you That's have 50 years well this is this is capitalism uh <laughs> distorting and and blocking another system from ever being able to to come into place because they have a financial incentive to act that way right you know they get tons of money being in their their positions of power because you know as, as like Pelosi does with all her insider stock trading not to mention just getting connections with all sorts of wealthy and powerful people at the heads of industry and stuff that they can let her later parlay into really lucrative careers um, you know if anything uh, lobbying on their behalf later on this, this, this revolving door between the private the, the top of the private sector and the top of the political sector um yeah the, the democrats have a vested interest a, 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 a capitalistic interest in keeping things basically how they are and maybe fiddling with some cultural stuff here and there so they can you know say well we fought the good fight or whatever but uh yeah, they, they, they want things to, to stay as they are, more or less. They don't want they don't want the, the, the base of their power to ever be questioned. So yeah, they're gonna destroy every um, progressive candidate and you know. <sighs> anyway. Off of that happy subject, let's 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 get a little bit further. I wanna get at least I would love to get another half hour in, but it doesn't appear as I'm going to this That's time. Okay. No, it's been a good I, conversation, though. Um, I may have to tap out shortly because okay. yeah. this chair is good for about 30 minutes. Okay. Well, we'll continue on. We'll see how far we can get. Appealed to the practical need of winning the war. Quote, we must have scouts, guides, spies, cooks, teamsters, diggers, and choppers from the blacks of the South, whether we allow them to fight for us. Or not, I entreat you to render a hearty and unequivocal obedience to the law of the land. Lincoln had already shown his attitude by his failure to countermand an order of one of his commanders, General Henry Halleck, who forbade fugitive Negroes to enter his army's lines. Now he replied to Greeley, quote, Dear sir, I have not meant to leave anyone in doubt. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. Yep, basically, yeah. So there's there's the, the, the modern-day democratic policy in a nutshell. If they, As long as they can maintain power, and um, then that's, that's where they're going to go, whether or not it's, it's, politi it's morally the right thing to do or not. So, uh, it's funny the way that he portrays Lincoln's voice. Because by all accounts, he had a very strange, high-pitched voice. Hi, my name is Hi, Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln. But I guess more with like a Chicago accent. He spent a lot of time in Chicago. 
Hi, my name is. Hey there, hold there. I'm uh, Abraham hey there. Lincoln. Oh, hey there, hold it's, there. it's it's hard to <laughs> hard to combine <laughs> high pitch in Chicago at the same time. Out there in Chicago land, eh? Anyway, it's a hard accent. Yeah, they, they probably had a you know, very much different accent at, at his in his time. Anyway, things have probably changed in 150 years. But let's continue. And if I could do it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I, I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because it helps to save this union. Yeah. And what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the union. I have here stated my purpose according to my view of official duty. And I intend no modification of my oft-expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. Yours, A. Lincoln. See, it's, it's Passive. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Whatever is politically expedient, basically. Not not willing to take a courageous stand on, on any sort of moral principle. That's that's Lincoln for you. And luckily, the abolitionists kept up their pressure on him and, you know. So you can never get into political office because I'm too, like, <laughs> this is how it is and I'm not going to back yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it really sucks because I think I could fix a lot of things. It's it's interesting to wonder what would have happened though if they had just let the South secede because one of the reasons that the South lost the war was because of counterfeiting, because all of the 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 uh, printing presses that were capable <sighs> enough of making you know high security money, like money that you couldn't just duplicate with a rubber stamp. They were all in the north, and so there there would be these these organizations that would uh, counterfeit just millions of dollars in in Confederate currency, and then send it with soldiers, and sell it to soldiers to to bring with them as they went down south, and it caused massive inflation for the south, and was a huge contributing factor. So so you wonder what would happen had they just let the south go and then just bankrupted them that way. Like, sent all kinds of counterfeit money in. Let the entire uh, country just, because like, yeah, there, there were there were not that many, you know, large and powerful cities in the South at that time because of slavery, because they just never had to be. The you know the the economy was based around a few wealthy families in each area who owned a bunch of slaves. And they had no reason to really build up any more of an economy. Um, and then, yeah, they they had they didn't really have the tools to conduct a, a modern government at the time. So, just would have been interesting to see how that might, of course, you know, it's counterfactual, never happened. Right. But just deny. Just yeah. Deny. Ow. No, I'm just saying it, it, it went counter to the way that, that things actually went. So you can speculate all you want, but it's, it's hard to know how things would have gone. I do sure. love to speculate. Yeah, speculation is is fun. It is one of my hobbies. Yeah. Right, moving on. So Lincoln distinguished his personal wish and, and his official duty. When in September 1862, Lincoln issued his preliminary emancipation proclamation it was a military move, giving the South four months to stop rebelling, threatening to emancipate their slaves if they continued to fight, promising to leave slavery untouched in the states that came over to the North. Quote, that on the first day of January, A.D. 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state the people whereof shall be then in rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforward and forever free. Thus, when the Emancipation Proclamation was okay, issued January 1st, 1863. Sorry. All right. Well, thanks for joining me. Of course. Thanks for giving your input on all that stuff. It's always fun to have you. It's my pleasure. Is this window still open? No, I, I don't really want the noise in oh, here yeah. right now. You don't want to hear the Indianapolis 500? No, no, no. Trials? You know. Think of or I suppose Fast and Furious part whatever, because that those movies just never end, but yeah, don't really want to hear it right at 
now I mean, or especially not at two in the morning. But especially, you know, it's just not the same since Paul Walker passed. That's true. Yeah, the franchise, series, the franchise has really gone downhill since then. Just like the street in front of our house. <laughs> what? Going downhill. That, that's true. There is there are hills in our neighborhood that we drive on. <laughs> I don't know who's going to make that connection, though, but you, it was a good try. You didn't yeah. make Thank it. You. If I had to explain it to yeah, you. Uh -huh. You know how I feel about having to explain a joke. Yeah, it makes it better. It's like seasoning it, right? Oh, my God. I'm just kidding. All right. Well, bye -bye. until next time, Amanda. Wow. This chair sucks. Yeah, we got to get some better chairs. I feel like I need to feng shui this bedroom or something. It is feng shui no, you don't want to have it underneath a window. You don't want to have your bed facing the door with your feet. That's what I know about feng shui in the bedroom. You don't want it to face that window? It's not supposed to be under the window. It's something about energies and flow and stuff. Maybe we should put it on this side and move the desk set up over there. No, I already have a wall. You're fine. No one hurt you. Shelf set up here. I said that one hurt you. You hurt me. Bye-bye now. All right. Let's see. Let's get back into the book. See how far we can get. It declared slaves free in those areas still fighting against the Union, which it listed very carefully and said nothing about slaves behind Union lines. As Hofstadter put it, the Emancipation Proclamation, quote, had all the moral grandeur of of a bill of lading. The London Spectator wrote concisely, quote, The principle is not that a human being cannot justly own another, but that he cannot own him unless he is loyal to the United States, unquote. Limited Ew. as it was, the Emancipation Proclamation spurred anti-slavery forces. By the summer of 1864, 400,000 signatures asking legislation to end slavery had been gathered and sent to Congress, something unprecedented in the history of the country. That April, the Senate had adopted the 13th Amendment, declaring an end to slavery. With a huge asterisk, being that you can still enslave people legally to this day, as long as they have committed a crime and, and been sentenced to go to prison. So you can pay people literally no money and force them to do work as long as they are in prison. Now, many states have passed their own laws prohibiting this sort of thing. In fact, most states have. But there are still some where that, that's still a legal practice, and there are plenty where you can still pay way below minimum wage. So effectively, you know, having that person be a, a slave and, and force them to work for, you know, uh, 13 cents a day, stuff like that. So yeah, big old asterisks in 13th Amendment. But still a good thing. Still a, a leap forward, for sure. But yeah, that, 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 that big loophole becomes even more of a problem, as we will see later on, after slavery has been abolished and the Civil War has been fought and uh, Jim Crow is instituted, and then even more so after Jim Crow is defeated because... It's a way to control the people that you want to control um, and have as much control over them as legally possible is, is to imprison them. So there's a huge incentive um, to put away all sorts of minority people in this country. And lo and behold, they are way disproportionately represented in the prison system. Okay, moving on. And in January 1865, the House of Representatives followed. With the proclamation, the Union Army was open to blacks, and the more blacks entered the war, the more it appeared a war for their liberation. The more whites had to sacrifice, the more resentment there was, particularly among, among poor whites in the North, who were drafted by a law that allowed the rich to buy their way out of the draft for $300. And so, the draft riots of 1863 took place. Uprisings of angry whites in northern cities, their targets not the rich far 
away, but the blacks near at hand. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and this... I'm trying to figure out how to phrase it, but this sort of a situation continues today. People get mad at those in in whose whose position is closer to their own proximity far more often than they get mad to, at the people that put the system in place and, and enforce the system from the top. It's very frustrating. Um, but they buy into the idea that, oh, look at, look at you. Look who's going to come steal your job. And then aren't things already hard for you already? Well, this person's going to come and steal your job and make it even harder for you. So aren't you mad at them? Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I guess I didn't have any bigger point to, to say about that. Just that it's incredibly frustrating that that tends to work. Fool people and to keep fighting each other at the bottom rather than look upwards to the source of the problems. It was an orgy of death and violence. A black man in Detroit described what he saw. A mob with kegs of beer on wagons armed with clubs and bricks marching through the city, attacking black men, women, children. He heard one man say, quote, if we are got up to be killed for Negroes, then we will kill everyone in this town. This civil war was one of the bloodiest. I mean, also, the, the... I would I would say that a big cause of of this sort of an outcome where where you have people at the bottom fighting each other uh, is because if you are at the bottom, you don't really have any political power over the people who are controlling your lives, the people at the top, the people that make the rules, the people that force you into debt, the people that you know constantly threaten to replace you if you act up too much at work. Those people, you don't really have much of a say over what they do, or at least you don't think you do. Um, so you lash out at, at people that you can, and that would be people that are still further below you um, in terms of power. But still, it, it is, yeah, frustrating. In human history up to that time 600,000 dead on both sides in a population of 30 million Jeez. the equivalent in the united states of 1978 with a population of 250 million of 5 million dead as the battles became more intense as the bodies piled up as war fatigue grew the existence of blacks in the south 4 million of them became more and more a hindrance to the south and more and more an opportunity for the north Boys in Black Reconstruction pointed this out, quote, These slaves had enormous power in their hands simply by, by stopping work. They could threaten the Confederacy with starvation. By walking into the federal camps, they showed to doubting northerners the easy possibility of using them thus, but by the same gesture, depriving their enemies of their use in just these fields. It was the plain alternative that brought Lee's sudden surrender. Either the South must make terms with its slaves, free them, use them to fight the North, and thereafter no longer treat them as bondsmen, or they could surrender to the North with the assumption that the North, after the war, must help them defend slavery. It wasn't far off. I mean, they, yes, they did get rid of the institution of slavery, but then, as we will see later on, uh, during Reconstruction, promised the, the freed black people, all sorts of things, delivered in, in, in many cases, but then took it back on behalf of their former masters. So for these plantation owners, for these, these wealthy Southerners, yeah, the ones that survived, they made out pretty well after, after the war and found themselves in, you know, not that much different of a position financially. Um, in fact, in, in many cases, the, the former slaves just becoming sharecroppers on their former master's land um, or working for them for very little money. So, yeah, things, uh, they, they made a, a, a gamble that that was the best way to 
hold on to power and and in many ways they were proven right uh yeah interesting though seeing seeing how the the balance of power shifts as as things go on I had more to say, but but it's escaping me right now. So we'll move on. As it had before. General Raywick, a sociologist and anthropologist, describes the development of blacks up to and into the Civil War. Quote, The slaves went from being frightened human beings, thrown among strange men, including fellow slaves who were not their kinsmen and who did not speak their language or understand their customs and habits, to what W.E.B. Du Bois once described as the general strike whereby hundreds of thousands of slaves deserted the plantations, destroying the South's ability to supply its army. Look at that. Look at that. Power of the general strike being one of the most uh, are, are having uh, well, let's let's try another run at that. The general strike is, is proven once again to be one of the most effective and powerful tools that, that any labor, even slave labor, has against the powers that be. Um, the 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 mass refusal to do work brings institutions, brings systems of power to its knees in in relatively short order. Because yeah, you you literally are the lifeblood of their economy. The workers are. Uh, that doesn't change just because they're not getting a wage. Um, yeah, interesting to see how effective that is once again. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the, the chapter where we talk about the general strike that was spurred on by uh, IWW and, and other leftist organizations later on in the country's history. That was also quite effective. And so much so that they roll out the army to put it down as soon as it happened. And drop the entire pretense that everyone was free to be whatever they could in the United States. And said, oh, you're destroying our way of life. You're trying to take this from us. And we rightfully deserve it. So they forced people back to work, work that time. But it's looking like the South, in this case, did not have that same ability to force everyone back to work. Black women played an important part in the war, especially toward the end. Sojourner Truth, the legendary ex-slave who had been active in the women's rights movement, became recruiter of black troops for the Union Army, as did Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin of Boston. Harriet Tubman raided plantations, leading black and white troops, and in one expedition freed 750 slaves. Damn. Women moved with the colored regiments that grew as the Union Army marched through the South, helping their husbands, enduring terrible hardships hardships on the long military treks, in which many children died. They suffered the fate of soldiers, as in April 1864, when Confederate troops at Fort Pillow, Kentucky, massacred Union soldiers who had surrendered, black and white, along with women and children in an adjoining camp. So again, we see <clears throat> all sorts of people contributing to a war effort, um, and they're being, in, in, in the, the heat of the war. They're being, I wouldn't say it's necessarily more egalitarian, but at least there's contributions of all, all sorts of people that, that naturally are, you know, uh, that are natural allies of one another in the face of, of the structure that oppresses them all. Um, it seems like it could have, again, could have been something, could have been a real revolution. Um, interesting that it didn't end up turning out that way. I guess we'll, we'll see why. It has been said that black acceptance of slavery is proved by the fact that during the Civil War, when there were opportunities for escape, most slaves stayed on the plantation. In fact, half a million ran away, about one in five, a high proportion when one considers that there was great difficulty in knowing where to go and how to live. Yeah, right? <laughs> you know? Uh, imagine, uh, like the Truman Show, right? Uh, someone who has lived their entire life in, in one area, doesn't know anything else or anybody outside of, of their little, you know, in that case, like literal bubble, 
and then all of a sudden walks out into the wider world that they know nothing about. They don't even know if it operates by the same rules that, that the world they, they grew up in uh, operates by. Yeah, they're going to be scared. Yeah, they're not going to necessarily want to make that choice because they won't feel equipped to do it. And they'll feel that it's risking their life to do so. That's pretty understandable. That does not prove that they, they you know, given equal choices to make, would make that choice. Right? If they had all the knowledge of the outside world, if they had all the resources to, to make it, that they would still make that choice. Because who would? Who, really, who would? This is all just, you know... That's all just an apology uh, again. Oh, they wanted to be enslaved. They enjoyed their slavery. Ugh. Disgusting. The owner of a large plantation in South Carolina and Georgia wrote in 1862, quote, This war has taught us of the perfect impossibility of placing the least confidence in the Negro. In two numerous instances, those we esteemed the most have been the first to desert us. That same year, a lieutenant in the Confederate Army and once mayor of Savannah, Georgia, wrote, wait, 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 wait. Who, who, who said that? I gotta go back. Gotta run that back. ...when one considers that there was great difficulty in knowing where to go and how to live. The owner of a large, large plantation uh -huh. in South Carolina and Georgia wrote in 1862... Oh, this just proves that they are terrible people because look at that. When they got the opportunity to desert us, they did. That means that they're bad people, not that we were bad for enslaving them and their family and every generation that would have come after them, too. This war has taught us the perfect impossibility of placing the least confidence in the Negro. In two numerous instances, those we esteemed the most have been the first to desert us. Huh. Huh. Almost as light as though they were just cozying up to you for survival so that they could then take a moment, uh, you know, an opportune moment to get away from you as, as, as fast as possible. Uh, this is this is the, the mentality of abusers, that the person that, that they abuse, it proves how terrible they are because as soon as they get the chance, they leave them. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you're the bad person in this scenario. Like, yeah. It's just very difficult to, to get into the mindset of these plantation owners. They really thought that they were doing something for these people by being so cruel and oppressive to them. That same year, a lieutenant in the Confederate Army and once mayor of Savannah, Georgia, wrote, quote, I deeply regret to learn that the Negroes still continue to desert to the enemy. A minute Minister in Mississippi wrote in the fall of 18... Like, like, is this just for show? Are they just saying that as, as propaganda to, to try and rally each other around their cause? Saying, hey, we have to try harder? Um, or, or, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's a very bizarre mentality that they would literally believe that... Or literally be, be stunned to learn that the people that they oppress don't like them. I guess you get the same sort of thing with um, employers. Like, anytime there's like a union drive or, or people come together, you know, even without an actual a formal um, uh, organizational effort and, and tell them how, how much they dislike working for that employer, so often they're just so stunned. Like, oh, what? do so much for you. I, I provide for all of your families. I, 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 I give you as much money as you deserve for the, the work that you're doing. And, uh, you know, they literally sound stunned to learn that their employees don't like them. It's funny. I, I just, I, I, yeah, have to dive into where that self-delusion comes from more. At some point. In 62, on my arrival, I was surprised to hear that our Negroes stampeded to the Yankees last night, or rather one of them. I think every one, but with one or two exceptions, will go to the Yankees. Eliza and her family are certain to go. She does not conceal her thoughts, but plainly manifests her opinion by her conduct, insolent and insulting. 
and a woman's plantation journal of January 1865 said, quote, The people all are idle on the plantations, most of them seeking their own pleasure. Many servants have proven faithful, others false and rebellious against all authority and restraint. Their condition is one of perfect anarchy and rebellion. They have placed themselves in perfect antagonism to their owners and to all government and control. Nearly all the house servants have left their homes, and from most of the plantations they have gone in a body. I mean, it would be like being shocked to, to learn as the, the owner of say like a, a, a factory farm operation, that the chickens that you stick in, in deplorable conditions to the point where, you know, they have to, well, I, I, don't, I don't want to get too graphic about it, but have to do terrible things to make sure they even survive. And it's just, you know, they're stacked on top of each other, living in their own filth. Uh, it, it would be like them being shocked to learn that the chickens don't like that and would choose a different life if they could. Maybe maybe that is their mentality too. Maybe they think that they're being super kind to these these dumb animals by giving them shelter and, and, a, and a place to live. Uh, talking about factory farmers here. Um, so maybe it's the same sort of thing with these plantation owners that the people that they treat as as human chattel. This is chattel slavery. Shocked to learn that they don't actually like living that way and would choose a different life if they could and do choose a different life when they have the opportunity. It's just so weird. It's, it's very hard for me to wrap my head around. Also in 1865, a South Carolina planter wrote to the New York Tribune that the conduct of the Negro in the late crisis of our affairs has convinced me that we were all laboring under a delusion. I believed that that these people were content, happy, and attached to their masters, but events and reflection have caused me to change How? these positions. How? If they were content, happy, and attached to their masters, why did they desert him in the moment of his need and flock to an enemy whom they did not know and thus left their perhaps really good masters? Perhaps who really they didn't good. Know from infancy. I mean, let's cut, like, <laughs> in the parlance of the current day, that, that's a big self report. <laughs> that you're that flabbergasted that they would leave you <laughs> if given the choice like how do you not, how do you not understand that that's a massive indictment of everything that you believe in uh, very odd genovese notes that the war produced no general rising of slaves but quote in lafayette county mississippi slaves responded to the emancipation proclamation by driving off their overseers and dividing the land and implements among themselves. Athica reports a conspiracy of Negroes in Arkansas in 1861 to kill their enslavers. In Kentucky that year, houses and barns were burned by Negroes, and in the city of Newcastle, slaves paraded through the city, quote, singing political songs and shouting for Lincoln, according to a newspaper account. After the Emancipation Proclamation, a Negro waiter in Richmond, Virginia, was arrested for leading, quote, a servile plot, unquote, while in Yazoo, Mississippi, slaves burned the courthouse and 14 homes. There were special moments. Robert Smalls, later a South Carolina congressman, and other blacks took over a steamship, the Planter, and sailed it past the Confederate guns to deliver it to the Union Navy. Most slaves neither submitted nor rebelled. They continued to do work, waiting to see what happened. When an opportunity came, they left, often joining the Union Army. 200,000 blacks were in the Army and Navy, and 38,000 were killed. Jeez. Historian James McPherson says, quote, Without their help, the North could not have won the war as soon as it did, and perhaps could not have won at all, unquote. What That's pretty amazing. Two blacks in the Northern Army and in the nor Northern cities during the war gave some hint of how limited the emancipation would be, even with full victory over the Confederacy. Off-duty black soldiers were attacked in Northern cities, as in Zanesville, Ohio, in February 1864 where cries were heard to, quote, kill the N-word, unquote. Black soldiers were used for the heaviest and dirtiest work, digging trenches, hauling logs and cannon, loading ammunition, digging wells for white regiments. What pride? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's not at all surprising to learn that conditions for, for black soldiers were not that much better in the North 
like yes you're getting rid of, of, of slavery which is abhorrent and terrible but that doesn't just mean that that every northerner and especially the people in power including military power is just going to suddenly stop being racist uh because of that like you, you don't you don't just get it's not like a i don't even know it's not like a power up in a racing game where you you, you get onto it and then you just <laughs> and like uh progress on in, in your your thoughts until you you literally view everyone as as equally valuable doesn't happen that way unfortunately so well you can certainly say that it would be a step up from literal slavery still not not super better it sounds like this received 13 dollars a month negro privates received 10 dollars a month late in the war a black sergeant of the third south carolina volunteers william walker marched his company to his captain's tent and ordered them to stack arms and resigned from the army as a protest against what he considered a breach of contract because of unequal pay. He was court-martialed and shot for mutiny. Oh, Finally, God. in June 1864, Congress passed a law granting equal pay to Negro soldiers. The Confederacy was desperate in the latter part of the war, and some of its leaders suggested the slaves more and more an obstacle to their cause be enlisted, used, and freed. After a number of military defeats, the Confederate Secretary of War, Judah Benjamin, wrote in late 1864, to a newspaper editor in Charleston, quote, It is well known that General Lee, who commands so largely the confidence of the people, is strongly in favor of our using Negroes for defense and emancipating them, if necessary, for that purpose. One general, indignant, wrote, quote, If slaves will make good soldiers, our whole theory of slavery is wrong, unquote. By early 1865, the pressure had mounted, and in March, President Davis of the Confederacy signed a Negro soldier law authorizing the enlistment of slaves as soldiers to be freed by consent of their owners and their state governments. But before it had any significant effect, the war was over. Former slaves interviewed by the Federal Writers Project in the 30s recalled the war's end. Susie Melton, I was a young gal, about 10 years old, and we done heard that Lincoln... Thank you, Ellie Osher, so much for the 12 bits. Good to see you, friend. How have you been? Um, uh, I would I would imagine you've probably been covering the uh, the events with with Trump recently, with the uh, the indictment and arrest, whatnot. So, hope you're having a good time with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, interesting times we live in, is it not? But anyway, uh, let me go shout out Ali Osher real quick. Everyone go check out their channel. I'm doing pretty well, Ali. Um, just started my job back uh, full time as a landscaper again, so that's been fun getting back into doing design work and that sort of thing. There you go. Everyone follow Alyosha's channel. Uh, tends to cover the White House quite a bit, but, but all sorts of cool political issues. Really good channel to watch. Um, yeah, I've been doing pretty good. Uh, it's finally warm here in Minnesota again, and it, it looks like we've gotten... We've, we've cracked through into real spring at this point. Hopefully it's not just a fall spring, but but as far as the, the weather will predict, looks like things are holding pretty steady at a reasonable spring temperature. Um, yeah, so cool. All right, let's get back into the book, see how far we can get in the next few minutes here. Probably going to stop once we get it to an hour and a half. That seems like a good place to, to stop. And there'll be just over 45 minutes left in this chapter. This is a long chapter, but it's also a very important one. I'm going to turn the words free. Oh, oh Mrs. there wasn't nothing to it. Then a Yankee soldier told someone in Williamsburg that Lincoln done signed the emancipation. It was wintertime and mighty cold that night, but everybody commenced getting ready to leave. Didn't care nothing about Mrs. was going to the Union lines. And all that night... Ben Words danced and sang right out in the cold. Next morning, 
at daybreak, we all started out with blankets and clothes and pots and pans and chickens piled on our backs. Because Mrs. said we couldn't take no horses or carts. And as the sun come up over the trees, the N-words started to sing it. Son, you'll be here and I'll be gone. Son, you'll be here and I'll be gone. Son, you'll be here and I'll be gone. Bye-bye, don't grieve after me. Won't give you my place, not for yours. Bye-bye, don't grieve after me. Because you'll be here and I'll be gone. In a woods. We wasn't there in Texas long when the soldiers marched in. Tell us that we were free. I remember one woman. She jumped on a barrel. And she shouted. She jumped off. And she shouted. She jumped back on again and shouted some more. She kept that up for a long time. Just jumping on a barrel and back off again. Oh, that would be amazing to see. Annie Mae Weathers said, I remember hearing my pa say that when somebody came and hollered, you N-words is free at last. Say he just dropped his, his hoe and said in a queer voice, thank God for that. Wow. The Federal Writers Project recorded an ex Slave named Fanny Berry, quote, and we're shouting and clapping hands and singing, chilling, running all, all over that the place. That would be interesting to get into at some point. The Federal Writers Project, I think I'm going to look that up as, as I let the, the book run here for a second. So I'm going to I'm gonna look and, and see what sort of archives there may be, uh, maybe even on, on YouTube. Beating time and yelling, everybody happy. Should hit some celebration. Run to the kitchen and shout in the window, Mammy, don't cook. No more, he's free, he's free. Many Negroes understood that their status after the war, whatever their situation legally, would depend on whether they owned the land they worked on or would be forced to be semi slaves for others. In 1863, a North Carolina Negro wrote that if the strict law of right and justice is to be observed, the country around me is the entailed inheritance of the Americans of African descent, purchased by the invaluable labor of our ancestors through a lot of peers and groans under the lash and yoke of tyranny. Abandoned plantations, however, were leased to former planters and to white men of the North. As one colored newspaper said, quote, the slaves were made serfs and chained to the soil. Such was the boasted freedom acquired by the colored man at the hands of the Yankee, unquote. Under congressional policy approved by Lincoln, the property confiscated during the war under the Confiscation Act of July 1862 would revert to the heirs of the Confederate owners. Dr. Isn't John that interesting so again mr politically expedient lincoln doesn't go so far as to totally strip all these these former slave owners of all their property which he should have done it, it should have that should have been it they lost the war and they should have had to been they should have had all their land and all their property forcibly redistributed uh to everyone too not 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 even just the the their former slaves but you know they they suppressed all of the um, they suppressed everybody who who wasn't them, everyone who was not a, a, a rich, white, slave-owning person. So, yeah, it could have been an opportunity for a whole lot of power redistribution to take place and to kind of grind down any potential for uh, a real backlash uh, from former slave owners. They just should not have had power anymore. That should have been it. But they did not take that path for whatever reason. Probably for a racist reason. Probably for a politically expedient reason. But yeah. Um, I did find there there is a, an archive. Um, so this one is, is Primary Sources, the Surviving Records of Slave Narratives, Part 1 of 2 with subtitles. Uh, it's, it's three and a half hours of former slaves telling their story themselves so maybe we'll get into that sometime might make a good uh i don't know epilogue addendum or, or whatever to to this series here but i'll put it in chat now in case you all are interested but i have to i have to bookmark that somehow let me just put the title on Copy that, put it into the chat as well. So there you go. In case you're interested in hearing former slaves in their own words, telling their story. That sounds incredibly interesting to me. So I'm going to share this. The channel is called Cultural Origins. 
Very interesting. History graduate and anthropology nerd who believes that everyone uh, can benefit from exploring the social and cultural history and different debates historians have had about them. Cool. Located in the United Kingdom of all places. Huh. Well, I will definitely subscribe to that channel and take a look at those narratives some other time, though. All right. Let's see how much. On Rock, a black physician in Boston spoke at a go. meeting. Quote, why talk about compensating masters? Compensate yeah, them for what? For what? For what do you rebelling owe them? for? What does the slave being owe them? some of the worst what people in history? Society owe them. Yeah. Compensate the master. It is the slave who ought to be compensated. Absolutely. The property of the South is by right the property of the slave. Yeah, and they were the ones that that uh, that did the work that literally amassed all of the wealth of those those slave owners so none of them deserve their wealth in the first place by by any stretch of the imagination they didn't do any of the labor at all to uh procure that wealth so they they should be do none of it and then also they were just assholes who didn't want to give up slavery and fought a whole war about it and cost hundreds of thousands of of uh, people's lives in the process so yeah there should be some freaking <laughs> redistribution of their power Completely. Unboat. Some land was expropriated on grounds that taxes were delinquent and sold at auction, but only a few blacks could afford to buy this. In the South Carolina Sea Islands, out of, of 16,000 acres up for sale in March of 1863, three men who pooled their money were able to buy 2,000 acres, the rest being bought by northern investors and speculators. A freedman on the islands dictated a letter to a former teacher now in Philadelphia. Quote, my dear young missus, do my missus tell Lincoln that we want land, this very land that is rich with the sweat of the face and the blood of we back. We could have been by all we want, but they make the lots too big and cut we out. The word come from Miss Lincoln's self that we take our claims and hold on to them and, and plant them, and he will see that we get them every man 10 or 20 acre. We too lad, we stake out and list, but for the time for plant, these commissionaries sells to white folks all the best land. Here's Lincoln. In early 1865, yeah. General question. William T. Sherman held a conference in Savannah, Georgia, with 20 Negro ministers and church officials, mostly former slaves, at which one of them expressed their need. Quote, The way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land and till it by our labor. Four days later, Sherman issued, quote, Special Field Order Number 15, unquote, designating the entire southern coastline 30 miles inland for exclusive Negro settlement. Freedmen could settle there, taking no more than 40 acres per family. By June 1865, 40,000 freedmen had moved onto new farms in this area, but President Andrew Johnson in August of 1865 restored this land to Confederate owners, and the freedmen were forced off. <laughs> oh, Andrew Johnson. Oh, let's, let's, let's read a little bit about Was he one of the ones who ended up being impeached? One of the presidents? Oh, yeah, so he was, he was Lincoln's vice president. Became the 17th president. Oh, he, he was a southerner himself. Oh, okay. A Jacksonian Democrat at that. So, as I've often said, Andrew Jackson, the the worst president in U.S. history, uh, just one of history's biggest monsters in the U.S. Responsible for the Trail of Tears and other Native removals. Just a wretched person through and through. And this guy, Andrew Johnson, calls himself a old-fashioned Southern Jacksonian Democrat. Of pronounced states' rights views. God, just a horrible person as well. Huh. 
Not surprised. Some at bayonet point. Ex-slave Thomas Hall told the Federal Writers Project, that's quote, So they're just like, oh, you know, here's all this land, everybody. This is the thing that we promised you uh, as, as part of your terms of fighting with us and, and you know, winning your own freedom. Here, here you go. Now go farm it. Oh, wait, just kidding. Uh, I didn't mean any of We didn't mean any of that. We're just going to take the land back because whoopsie and give it back to the people that we took it from in the first place. Okay. And got the praise for freeing us. But did he do it? He gave us freedom without giving us any chance to live to ourselves. And we still had to depend on the southern white man for work, food, and clothing. Mm -hmm. And he held us out of necessity and want in a state of servitude, but little better than slavery. So surprising, too, that, that capitalism even in this, well, <laughs> even, but especially at this time, also had no answers for the poor and destitute, you know. Didn't even make a pretense at that time that everyone can be uplifted by it, but... Yeah, surprise, surprise. Capitalism works for people that already got power and virtually nobody else. The American government had set out to fight the slave states in 1861, not to end slavery, but to retain the enormous national territory and market and resources. Yet victory required a crusade, and the momentum of that crusade brought new forces into national politics. More blacks determined to make their freedom mean something. More whites, whether Freedmen's Bureau of officials or teachers in the Sea Islands or carpetbaggers with various mixtures of humanitarianism and personal ambition concerned with racial equity. There was also the powerful interest of the Republican Party in maintaining control over the national government with the prospect of Southern Black votes to accomplish this. All right, so we're at an hour and 30 minutes. That's about where I wanted to end it, so... Thankful we got there today, just in the nick of time. Not enough people to to do a raid, but we will. I will shout out another channel. Try to pick one that I haven't done before. Let's see who is on right now. Let's see. Oh, that's just a video game. We'll do. We'll try to do, find some other political channel. Yeah. Non-comment chick is just doing leftist drama, so I'm not gonna send you all to that. Let's see what Subversive History is up to. Perhaps we'll pick them. Oh, fundraising for Books Through Bars. That's a very important um, charity. They, they give leftist literature to um, prisoners. Actually, it's a pretty good success rate of... Um, bringing people into the left, so very cool. So they're taking on Killing Hope by William Blum, Chapter 10. Ah, oh, so it's a lot, of, a lot of the same sort of stuff we're doing right now. But we're not going to raid because not enough people. But I will certainly oh, recognize a few people in the chat there. That's cool. So we'll shout them out anyway. Go check them out at your leisure. But looks like they do. I'm not super familiar with their channel, but it's, you know, they're doing the same sort of thing we're doing right here. So sounds like a good time. And with that, I will say goodnight to y'all and uh, see you next time. I think the next time we'll meet will be Sunday. I have Dan Platt back on the show and we'll continue on with our series on utopias and tools for for organizing uh, so until then have a good night and uh yeah 
I don't, I don't have a more clever sign off right at the moment. So have a good night.